Alright, at this point you now have a gate that opens and closes by way of matinee. However, before we get completely away from matinee, I want to give you a walkthrough of the user interface. Now you might be thinking, wait, we've already used it. You're going to show us the interface now? And the answer is yes. Parts of the interface will be easier to understand now that you've completed a very simple task with matinee. Now, matinee itself can be used for things from uh, as simple as just opening this gate to as complex as an entire motion picture, if you like. But we're going to keep things relatively simple. Let's open up Kismet and double-click on our matinee sequence object. And let's just give an I kind of start off with a general idea of the various areas of the interface. First off, you have a menu bar along the top, and we'll talk more about some of the options within that in a moment. Then we have a toolbar with several of the most common uh, commands and features that you'll be using as you create your own sequences. Now down from here, you may see the curve editor, and then again you might not. If you don't see the curve editor, if instead your matinee looks like this, then all you need to do is go to the window menu and show the Unreal Matinee curve editor, and there it is. Now this is like the curve editor of any animation package that you may have potentially used before, uh, such as 3ds Max or Maya. The way animation works inside of Matinee is through keyframes and interpolation curves. You're going to place keyframes along a timeline, and those keyframes will store a time when they occur, and they will store a value. That can be graphed in a two-dimensional axis, and the computer will automatically create a curve that blends between any two keyframes and thereby define the animation, define what happens in between one keyframe and the next. You can edit those curves here. Now, just as a for instance, We've already got our sliding gate. At any point, you can see the curves of an animated object by clicking on this little tiny black box at the end of your track. So if we click on that, we can now see the curve for our sliding gate. Now I'm just rolling the mouse wheel out, but it'd probably be more efficient to start talking about uh, some of the buttons here. So what I'm going to do is click Fit View to All, and now we can actually see that curve. So there's the change in our gate's position over time. Now moving down from here, we have the group track list area. This allows us to see all of the different groups and, of course, any tracks that have been applied to those groups. As you get deeper into using Matinee, you're going to start filling this up with a lot more tracks. And, of course, each track is going to carry a lot of different keyframes, though in this case we're just simply using two. Now down from here we have the timeline, and this is where you're going to drag your time slider around. And you also have a range slider as well that you can use to slide the entire timeline. Though generally I find myself just grabbing up here inside the, the main list where all my keyframes are and I can slide that around. That's, that of course is just using the left mouse button. Now at the bottom we have the properties area. This will be context sensitive depending on what you have selected. So if you have a movement track, these are the properties that show up. If we grab a group, we get an entirely different set of properties. And all of the different types of tracks you can create will show different properties as well. Now if you select a group and right click on it, there are many different types of tracks you could potentially apply. And most of these are pretty specialized and you can see it just by looking at their names. For instance, we have color property track which allow you to animate color. Uh, we have things like a vector material parameter track which is good for animating materials. Uh, things like the anim control track and this is how you're going to animate a skeletal mesh or apply an animation track to it, which is something that we'll take a look at when we start animating cinematic sequences in a later video. So that's a quick look at the general sections. Now let's get just a little bit more specific. Up here in the menu bar, we start off with file, and of particular importance here is the import option. This will allow you to import camera animation data from a package such as 3ds Max and Maya, so you can animate a camera via a path and import that in if you like. Down from here, we have the Edit menu. Now, this has got some stuff that is fairly obvious and some other things that may not be. First off, we have Undo and Redo. We also have Delete Selected Keys and Duplicate Selected Keys. So if you don't want to actually have to create a new key and change its value, you can just select one and duplicate it. We can, ins we can insert a space at a current location. Now, this is most important, like if I had a lot of different keys and I decided that I just needed to plug a few more in and there was no time in between them, I could just slide my time slider to a current location and insert some space. And down from here, we have stretch section. This actually warrants me stepping away for just a little bit. You'll notice down here in my timeline, I've got some flags. So we've got this little green flag here, which I can drag around, and you'll notice that gives us a nice green selection. 
and it's got a closing flag as well. We also have the red flags, which allow us to control our overall animation length. If I adjust these green flags, I can use these to single out a specific section of our animation. And here inside the edit menu, I can stretch that section, I can delete that section, or I can select the keys within it. We have a reduce keys option. This will try to simplify your animation by taking out keys which are redundant within a specific threshold. So if two, two keys are relatively close to each other in value or time, they will be culled. Now, uh, moving down from here, we have save as path building positions and jump to path building positions. These are useful with AI. Uh, basically, when your bots are running along their little AI navigation paths, they can run into a door and get confused if the path doesn't go right through. The catch to that is when you lay down navigation points, you got to build everything. So you're gonna, you gotta click the build paths button. And if there's a door in between two path nodes, that path can be cut off. So what you can do is set up a position here in Matinee where all of your doors are open or any particular door you may be looking at and save that out as a path building position. And then before you build your paths, click jump to path building positions. That'll open up all your doors and your paths will all go right through. You can also configure some keyboard shortcuts and this is fairly self-explanatory. You're just going to pick the command you want and then you can bind a new key to it. Now we have a view menu as well. This has got some interesting options. Draw 3D trajectories will actually show a trajectory in the viewport. Now to really show that, I've got to restore down the matinee window and kind of slide it out of the way. We've got to close Kismet. And if you take a look, we've got a 3D trajectory here along the top of the gate showing us the motion that the gate will take. That's really all that option is going to do for us. If we were to turn that off, that trajectory goes away. Now let's put our matinee window back up nice and big. We can choose to show trajectories for all tracks or hide them all. We can decide whether or not snapping is on. And there's a couple of other snap options here as well that won't really be all that important until we get to the toolbar, and I'll discuss them then. We can show the cursor position for all NM keys, just kind of moving down through the options here. We can fit the view to a particular sequence. We can fit the view to, to the selection with this green selection here. Or we can fit the view to a loop. We can also toggle the curve editor from here. Now, moving over, our window is really an easy menu. We've got the ability to show and hide the curve editor and the properties panel. Now, down from here, we have the toolbar. Toolbar has, the, well, the very first button is something you may find yourself using a lot, though I don't think I ever do. This is the add key button. This is how you add a keyframe. Though the enter key will do the same thing, so I don't think I ever reach up here and click on that. Maybe if you've, you know, maybe you're sipping on coffee with your left hand, so it's easier to click something. Now, you can also choose the default type of keyframe that you're going to create. Now, I don't expect this to be a perfectly clear concept unless you've played with animation curves before, but essentially you can control how the interpolation curve will be created in between each of your keyframes by default. Now, we, can, we have some playback controls here. We have the ability to play our animation, loop a section, which means all we do is we designate a selection of the animation using our little green flags here and we can loop that over and over again which is great for complicated animations we have stop which is pretty obvious if you uh, click stop twice it will rewind your animation and you can play in reverse so if you want to watch everything backwards you can which can be very helpful if you're trying to time out an animation precisely now moving on from here, you have your playback speeds. These are pretty self-explanatory. You can go all the way down to 1% of your overall speed. You have undo and redo. You have toggle curve editor. You can switch that on and off. We can toggle snapping, and currently we are snapping. So as we try to move, say for instance, these flags, you'll notice they're snapping. If I was to try to move a keyframe around, you'll notice that snaps as well. If I turn this off, we get smooth motion. Now you can change the snapping increment as well. Currently we're snapping to 0.05 seconds, but you have other values as well. Like for instance, we could set to uh, 24 frames a second, 25 frames a second. If you're making an actual video for NTSC, you could set it to 29.97. As soon as you do this though, you're gonna notice some other snaps will appear. So we have the ability to snap time to a specific frame because now you're dealing with a frame rate if you're doing uh, 29.97 frames per second where originally you were just dealing specifically with time. So now if you want, you can snap to a specific frame or you can use a fixed time step playback. This is going to make sure that you are playing back 
uh, at the rate specified. So for instance, this will make sure that we would be playing back at 29.97 frames per second for NTSC. Now I'm going to set this back to 0.05. We can fit the view to our entire sequence. So if I'm zoomed, uh, say, way out here, and let me make sure that I switch back to 0.5. I scrolled my mouse wheel without having focus. So let's say we're zoomed out really far. We can fit the view to the entire sequence. So now you can see my first keyframe and my last keyframe are at the edges of the screen. We can fit the view to selected, which means I'd have to have something selected. Let me grab this guy and click, and now we're just, boom, right there on that particular keyframe, which we zoomed in really close to that. We can also fit the view to the loop section. So this little green selection I have here, we can zoom right into that at any point. And we can fit the view loop to the sequence, which means if I click this, our green section is going to take up the entire timeline. And there it goes. So that's a quick look at the toolbar. Now moving down from here, we've got the curve editor, which has its own toolbar. We have the ability to fit our view both horizontally and vertically, and this is going to become more apparent if I zoom out, you know, so our curve is really, you know, far away in the distance. We can fit horizontally, which stretches our curve out. Now, this doesn't change the information. You have to keep in mind that what we're doing is we're graphing a value over a specific time. You can zoom in or zoom out in time and not zoom in or zoom out in value. The two can be zoomed independently. So we can fit the view horizontally and vertically, or you can just click view to all. We can also fit to selected. So if we select a single key, we can zoom directly to that. So let's go ahead and just view to all. Now next to this, we have our two different uh, navigation modes. We have pan mode, which allows us to pan this around very much like an orthogonal viewport over inside the main editor. We can use the mouse wheel to zoom in and out. We also have zoom mode, and this allows us to zoom vertically using the left mouse, and zoom horizontally using the right mouse. And if you use left and right together, you're zooming both at the same time. Just make sure when you're done that you switch back to pan mode so you can move around if you want to. Now, over from here, we have all of the different tangent types that we can apply to our curve. Currently, if we take a look at the animation for our gate, you'll see that it starts off relatively flat, so the motion is minimal. It starts off as actually none, and then it accelerates, starts to sweep up, and then the curve is going to level back off, which defines it slowing down. We're decelerating before we come to a stop. It's a nice smooth motion where we don't get any kind of jarring stops. Now, if we wanted to show this, I could pull down matinee just enough so we could see the gate. And if I click play, it may be a little bit hard to notice. So let me actually pull down my playback rate. Let's try 25 and see how that looks. So there you go. We start off slow and we slow down right at the end. It's a very nice, smooth motion. But we can change that to anything we like by adjusting our tangencies from one point to the next. So by default, we're using curve auto clamped. What that means is that Unreal is actually going to handle the, uh, the tangency for us, and they're going to be clamped so that we don't get overshoot. Now, what is overshoot? Well, I'll make some overshoot, and then you'll know. So let's grab curve user. This allows us to actually take the tangent handles for the Beget curves and update them however we want to. So let's do something like this. And that guy that I just picked there, I'm going to flatten him back out to where he was because I don't want him to do that. All I want to do is grab this one curve that's sliding our gate up. And notice I just took the tangent handle and pulled it up a little bit. And because we have Beget style tangency, our curve now goes way up into the air and then comes back down. So what does this look like when we play back? Well, we're going to go, if we stop, we go way beyond the point of opening, all the way into the wall, and then we come back. If we show this in wireframe, it might be a little bit easier to see. So let's stop and play. So we slide way over, and then we come back. That's overshoot. And having clamped uh, tangent types will prevent things like overshoot from happening. And they can happen automatically. So we'll switch back to curve auto clamped. Now we also just have regular curve auto, which in a case this simple is not really going to be significantly different. If we want to be able to change the tangent types like we did a second ago, we just need to switch over to user. Now, if you have an automatic tangent type and you come over and you change the tangent handle, it will automatically switch over to user for you. So we could have a gate which starts off really slow and then accelerates and slams open. So here's what that would look like. In fact, let's go ahead and go back to a lit mode because it looks cooler. And really slow, and then wham, it opens up. And that would look even cooler at full speed. So I got to do it. I had to show you. 
You can just hear the bang of it, you know? Okay, so now let's expand that back out. So there's all of our tangent types. We have uh, curve break if you want to use cusp points where your, uh, your curve would kind of spike, meaning your animation would come to a screeching halt and then maybe change direction. Uh, we have the linear type, which would just be a constant rate of motion. And we have constant, which means you get no interpolation. You just stay at one value and suddenly blink to another value. It's really good if you want to animate something like a blinking light. Now, we can flatten the tangents to the axis. So if we click that, notice it just flattened out my tangent. We can also choose to make our tangents parallel or straighten them back out. So this would be if you had broken some tangents, say, in the middle of a curve, which I'll do real quick, just to show you how it's done. If we drop a new keyframe in here, which I did just by pressing the Enter key, and we'll do break curve tangents. I can move this guy down and this guy over. And if you're curious, which whether you are or not, I'm going to show you what this would look like. Let's go ahead and hit pl stop and play. Boom. You see there's a little bit of a hitch in there while we change direction. More obvious if we slow down the animation. And thunk. So it's like it caught something in the track, which is pretty funny. Now, if we wanted to straighten those back out, we could just select the key and straighten out the tangents. But what I'm going to do is actually delete out that key altogether. Okay, now down from here, we can show all of the curve tangents simultaneously if we need to see them all. We can also create curve tabs. Now, this is not really going to be particularly useful until we have a lot of different things animated. But basically, this allows you to take your animation curves and put them into groups. As you create tabs, you can add curves into those tabs and then cycle through all of the tabs you've created using this dropdown. And then if you decide you're done with a tab, you can just delete that tab. It won't delete the curve. It'll just delete the organizational system. So that is a pretty general overview of the Matinee user interface. I understand it's a lot of talking, and if you're not the kind of person who really enjoys walking through this, well, congratulations on making it this far in the video. But I do want to mention that, really, you're not going to get the hang of using Unreal Matinee until you start animating objects with it. So, you know, I encourage you to strike out and find things, start playing with movers, uh, drop in a skeletal mesh and move it around the level. And if you want to know how you can apply animation to a skeletal mesh, Take a look at our videos over creating cinematics with Matinee, and you'll see some really cool tricks for doing that. Also, remember the different types of tracks you can create. So just remember, you can right-click on any group, and there's a lot of different things you can play with. There is one more type of track, which I will mention, but I'm not going to go too far into, simply because it is uh, covered pretty nicely over in the... Uh, the cinematic section, but if you right-click, you'll notice you can create a director group, which is going to split up your interface pretty uh, dramatically, which is the only reason I'm bringing it up. A director group is kind of a, a combination between a camera switcher and any kind of motion picture style effects you want to apply. So, for instance, you have a director track. This allows you to jump between multiple cameras you may have in your level. And if we right-click on our director group, we can add things like a fade track, if we want to fade our animation in and out. We can add a slow-mo track, which allows us to animate changes in playback rate. So if you want to slow everything down, you can do that. We have a master audio track, and we can even scale the color of the overall scene. So a lot of controls that you have at this point. Every matinee that you create can only have a single director group, so keep that in mind. Only a single director track. So that will wrap things up for this video. Thanks a lot.